One Percenter Podcast with Sam Bakhtiar, bringing you the one percent knowledge to help you reach your full potential. Learn what it takes to rise above the ninety-nine percent and become a one percenter. Hey guys, welcome to the One Percenter Podcast. It's your boy Sam Bakhtiar, the host. I got my man, a good friend, and a very, very interesting story. Jonathan Alsacer in the house, U.S. veteran, I mean, to the highest level. You know, he served the country. He has a quite a crazy story because he was into soccer and he thought he was going to go, you know, get a soccer scholarship. That didn't work out, you know. And Jonathan, I'm just going to let you talk about, like, you, yeah, just dive into your story real quick for us. Uh, I love you, brother. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm just so humbled to be here with you. And yeah, man, I, w- I played soccer my whole life and it, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I was on the number one team ranked in California when I was like my senior year of high school in competitive soccer. And I, th- I was like, man, I'm a shoe in for some type of scholarship, right? And lo and behold, I didn't realize you got to take tests for people to scout you. <laughs> so, so I was like, oh, crap. Uh, but signed up for the military and led me down my path now, which is... Um, I went into the military, thought I was going to get special operations. I was like, oh, yeah, I can just tell them to put it in the contract. It didn't work out that way. I got noticed in basic training by a drill sergeant. And he's like, dude, you're a freaking stud. You're running two miles in like 11, 15, 11, 30. And you max out all your PT scores. He's like, what do you, you know, what contract do you want? And I was like, hey, man, send me Army Rangers. He comes back the next day. And I signed that contract after formation. So, so, you know, why, why army rangers? Why, why, you know, why was it like a Navy SEALs or other thing like that? I'm just curious to know. Yeah. Well, at the time, so I had signed up for the army. I was in basic training for the army. So my options for special operations at the time was special forces or rangers. Um, you have a couple other, like there's one other small group, but they're like the high echelons, which you got to try out for later. Um, but it's, which these two are obviously very high, but so, um, he offered me and I knew about Rangers and they're like the tip of the spear. These are the dudes freaking cracking skulls overseas. Um, they're going in, kicking in doors at nighttime. You know, we were known as the, uh, uh, the green eyed demons to the Iraqis. Cause we'd come in at nighttime. We'd have the night vision on all you could see was the green on our face. Um, so yeah, man, it was the tip of the spear and I knew about them. And I was like, man, I, I really just love to go. And I, and I was still a kid. I was 17. I had no concept of how hard it was actually going to be. <laughs> so. so, so you went in there, you got in there and shortly after that, how long after that did you go to work? Um, so yeah, man, once I got through all my training, it was airborne. And then I got through, um, all my extra training to become special operations. I was literally at battalion for, man, maybe two and a half months. And then I was on my first tour to fricking Missoula rock. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was, it was dicey. You were what about 18 then? Yeah, I was only 18 and we were, we were waking up every morning, um, to mortar rounds. So they were mortaring. We, uh, we had a compound that was right by one of the, the, the airfields. Cause that's kind of how we operated out of there as well. And, um, we would wake up to getting mortared every day. Uh, basically it's like an alarm clock and you're just like, man, if they fly one over here, we're, <laughs> this is going to be dicey right now. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Well, tell, tell, tell me a quick, crazy story, you know, cause I know, you know, you've been in so many combats, right. You know, so many things. Tell, tell me a quick, crazy story that, that you, you know, that, that, or a close call. Oh man. Um, we had, uh, quite a few, but there was one distinctly, um, we, we were breaching, we were taking down a, a house and we get up, um, we clear the bottom part of the house and then we start getting up towards the stairs to go up to the roof. And we have, we, we had knowledge that there was, you know, terrorists on the roof with weapons. And so I'm, I'm the team leader going up there and I got my breacher at the door. And because, um, as, as you're, you're well aware, like the, the houses are a lot, like they're dusty and everything. So when you breach something with ex- explosives or you get in a gunfight in a house, all of a sudden all this dust kicks up. So we're at the top and we're at the top of these stairs and there had been dust that had been kicked up and we can't see too well. So my guy's going to breach the door and he shotguns the door and we go and I go to kick it and uh, it freaking doesn't go anywhere. And I'm like, dude, we got freaking guys on the other side of this damn door. <laughs> like, what the fuck? So I'm like, ah, oh, kicking it. Dude, after the kind of smoke cleared a little bit, it was an open uh, towards us. So, so, so these guys now know clearly we're coming around the corner. Like we're coming through this door and we get up to the roof. 
and we do our techniques to go out there and clear the roof and end up getting in. It, it was, thank God it was our guns first, but we ended up shooting these guys, but these guys were sitting there hunkered down. There's about three of them with AK 47s waiting for us to turn the corner. We were just faster on the triggers, but it was an incredibly close, close call because that split second, it was, you know, in favor of us could have easily been in favor of them. Wow. Wow. So yeah. can you tell me what are some of the lessons that you learned, you know, you know, serving the country and being in Rangers and being overseas? Man, uh, I learned a lot about myself is that um, really, you know, taking yourself seriously and being confident in any situation, regardless, like kind of how you're going into it with um, knowledge or not can be a very good asset. If you show confidence in a lot of ways, people are going to be more accepting to you. They're going to be more inviting to you because they're, you already, you already conduct yourself with in a way with energy that you're like, Hey, I'm confident in who I am at least, even if I don't know all the answers. So that confidence was something that really got instilled in me early on. And, and I started to find out what it took to really be a good leader because in those situations, um, being a good leader is pivotal because your men are going to bat for you. They're watching your back and you're vice versa. You're doing the same thing. Your lives are on the line every time you guys go out. So there's this being a good leader. You need to be, um, you have to show that you're willing to get in the trenches with your guys and that no task is above you uh, helping them when it gets down to it. And that comes all the way back to training. And then the, the, one of the biggest things I learned is, the more you train yourself, and this can be anything, business, life, um, anything, the more you train your mind and yourself on it, the higher level your base level of training goes. So what I mean by this is guys that are really superior, these dudes that are the one percenters, the elite, what happens is they go through the same trials and tribulations, but they train themselves so well that when their sympathetic nervous system kicks in and everything's on fire, their level of their base level of training is so high, they look like they're above everybody else. All they did was just continually train their mind and their bodies. And I learned how pivotal that was. So I learned that even in life, you, you can't relax on how you're training yourself. I love that, man. I love that. I mean, that is so true. That is so true. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, I guess you have to go through a process so many times and play it in your mind so many times over and over again you know, it's kind of like, you know, one of my favorite moves was James Bond. You know why? Because the world is falling down, but the guy is still like drinking his martini and, 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 and banging the chick. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, like people are shooting at him, you know, and he's still, you know, and I'm like, man, this guy is really cool and collected, you know, and, and well, that doesn't come in real life. That, that's a movie, but in real life, that only comes from training over and over and over again and mentally preparing for that scenario over and over and over again, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And you know this better than a lot of people is in business. Shit is going to hit the fan, man. You are going to have the world kind of burned down at some point, you know, and, and you've seen this countless times with guys who are extremely successful. What happens is they've trained themselves to handle that so much better that when, when their mind gets thrown out of it and they're reacting on habits and instincts, their habits and instincts are so high because you guys have constantly put into practice how to manage that and compartmentalize and be at your top level, even when the world around you is burning. Love that, man. So confidence. Yeah. And, and training. Yeah, absolutely. You know, those, those, those are, those are huge. Now, um, and I know yeah, you got to, you know, uh, you know, I know that at some time you left the military and, yeah. you know, you, you know, left the military yet, yet, you know, and you wanted to come in back into the world. Right. And that, that, that got to be a kind of a tough transition, right? Yeah. You know, it was a tough transition because you're like, you're, you're into like, you know, uh, you know, this, you know, it, it's a lot of adrenaline, you know, a, a lot of things popping off. And then all of a sudden you come back to the civilian world and now you're like, you found yourself at a desk job, I believe, right? You know, you know, you know found yourself at a desk job you're coming over there, you know, now, you, like I said, you're shooting enemies and doing this now you come like, behind a computer, you're like, oh my God, what's going on? Can you elaborate on that and how you felt and, and, uh, and what was going on in your mind then? Yeah, I love that question too, brother. And I'll back up just one second is even after I got out of the military, I went over and protected the U.S. ambassador to Iraq for five years with, uh, with a private company. So I was um, the tactical commander for, for that team for five years. And 
that was had his own inherent uh, risk. You're, you're on a political mission and you got to remain like calm, but alert. And then you're having to sit there and understand that if something happens, this person's life is in your hands and you got to make sure that you plan for that. Also, when, when, when I was reading your bio, you know, you know, and during those five years, you got like a double master's degree, didn't you? You know, you, <laughs> you were like, like you were actually, you didn't, you don't, you weren't wasting time. You know, you weren't playing Xbox or nothing like that. You actually took that time to, to actually get a degree and educate yourself. You want to talk about that a little bit because, because like you weren't interested in that before, but you know, you're like, well, well I'm here for five years. I might as well, you know, educate myself, get, get myself, you know, a degree or two, which you did. You almost, you almost went for the PhD, but you decided on double masters. Elaborate on that for me, please. Yeah, and I love that, man. I actually haven't talked about this too much. This is actually probably the first time I've really talked about it on a show, um, so it's cool. But yeah, I, I didn't see the point in like sitting around and doing nothing. And so I wanted to be like, well, if I make the or when I make the transition back to, you know, quote unquote, the real world, um, I need to have this. And so I went and got a bachelor's degree and then got um, a master's. And then I was working on a PhD, as you said. And then I turned that into a second master's just because at the time I just finished it as I came home after those five years. So I ended up getting, yeah, two masters and a bachelor's. But for me, it wasn't even um, what I realized afterwards. And I know you can attest to this too, is that it wasn't even about the pieces of paper. Yeah, that's what society wants to see. But it taught me how to be a free thinker, to be honest. It taught me how to research and really dissect information. And that helped me to really be just even better in uh, my path outside of the military and paramilitary world. So it was, it was really cool. I loved doing it. And I thought it was incredibly hard because it was all remote, which is extremely hard. I don't have like a teacher there. I can just talk to and stuff, especially remote. I was in Iraq. So <laughs> time, time was off, but yeah, man, it, I, it put a lot of value in myself. And again, that established, helped me establish that confidence when I came back to the U S and started working a desk job and doing those things. I, I, I was no longer kind of like in this floundering of, oh man, I'm not equivalent to them because I don't have the education, but it's like, no, I actually have it. So that helped my confidence as, as a man as well. Absolutely. So. so. So now, like now you find yourself behind the desk job. Let's go to now you find yourself a desk job. And you know, yeah. you know, I think, you know, somewhere I read that, you know, you're like, God, oh, there's gotta be more to life than me just coming behind a desk. And then, you know, have, you know looking forward, forward to a weekend barbecue you know, and all that, you know, all that. And, 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 you know, you got married and you, you know, you, you know, that, and that was falling apart. You know, that's something I want you to talk about. Cause that's so huge. And I, I think, you know, me also having a marriage that fell apart, you know, and, and with, as men, sometimes, um, you know, as we get into the workplace and start, you know, getting married and, and start having, you know, having a family, sometimes we just kind of lose our masculinity you know, and we kind of like, you know, feel like, you know, oh, is this all there's left in my life? Is this it? You know, and we go through a, a downward spiral and, and kind of downward, downward depression. I've seen so many men, you know, you know, kind of like, uh, kind of become the Al Bundy. <laughs> yeah. You know, the Al Bundy, you know, they go, you know, work and they come home, get in front of TV and, you know, you know, get a beer and then go, you know, you know repeat the process and, then, and that's it in their life. You know, yeah. so I would love to see, get your perspective on it. Yeah, and, and I love that question as well. Uh, a mediocre mindset produces a mediocre life, man. And so I was, uh, I was, I came back, I transitioned over, and it took about six months before my mindset got real mediocre. And I was like, wow, where's my purpose? And I was like, I, I lost that. I tied it to this bigger picture of the flag. I tied it to defending my brothers and all these things, but I never did, tied it to who I was inside. So I lost this purpose. I started to lose who I was as a, as a man. And that's when a lot of the hardships in my relationship showed up. Um, and so this mindset that I had of, wow, where am I? What am I doing? What am I serving? Like, there's got to be something more. It became this, and this is what I know a lot of men experience. It became this, let me go plug in, plug out of work, get home, watch TV, live for Friday and Saturday so I can drink or drink with friends, go out to a, a party or something like that, go out to a bar and then do it all over again. But there was no happiness in that for me. And that's where a lot of like my own form of like depression came in. And I was like, dude, this is not me. I'm a happy person. I love life. I love having friends. I love having a purpose. I love looking at every day and seeing potential instead of saying, well, today's another shitty day. I'm just going to wait till Friday, right? Like that, and think about how much of your life you actually lose when you have that mentality. So 
I started to really struggle with that. And uh, that's when the only thing I had at that time that I really, really anchored into was the gym. Uh, I, I've always loved the gym. It's been a huge passion of mine. So I anchored into the gym, but that still wasn't fulfilling me. There was no purpose there other than just, yeah, I get to look good and like I'm confident in my body. But other than that, like what's really there for me? Um, so I really struggled with that. And then my marriage started to fall apart. Uh, I got divorced. And at that point, I would, realized. Would you say your marriage fell apart because you were lost, you know, and you weren't happy within you, you know, uh, you know, you know, was that why your marriage fell apart or, or was it something different? Um, so the past me would love to put it all on her, but the me now looks introspectively and says, yeah, that was me. I, I had a lot to do with that too, because the energy I was putting out and the effort I was putting out was that mediocre or sub mediocre effort. And so I was getting the mediocre sub mediocre result, which is a not healthy communication, not a healthy love life, not a healthy anything in my relationship. So I have to take a hundred percent responsibility for the role that I played in it. And as much as at that time, I would have loved to have been like, it's all her fault. She didn't want to do any of this stuff. She didn't want to meet me halfway. No, the introspection's like, dude, did you really meet her halfway? Did you give her the space? Were you that, that husband she thought she was getting like the one that she bought into? Are you showing up better and holding her up when she's down. Like I wasn't doing any of those things either. So the reality was, is at the time I would have, I wanted to blame her, but at the, right after that, I started to find out, wow, man, I got to look into myself. There's got to be more to this. This isn't, I, I can't keep blaming other people. And that's where we, we always want to play the victim. We're, we're conditioned to play the victim in life when it comes to anything, when it comes to your relationships or business or work, we all want to play the victim. And it takes, in my opinion, it takes a true person, even not just even a man, but a true person to do the introspection and say, where is it that my perceptions and my mentality kind of went wrong here? Or where did I choose to make the outcome the way that it happened? So for me, yeah, man, I, I took that introspection. And as I really lost kind of everything in my world at that time, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm literally across the country from my family, all my family's in California. So it's not like I'm sitting there hanging out with them. I'm literally on my own, don't have any real friends here in like the Virginia area at that time. And I'm like, holy crap, man, like, I don't have anything. I got my dog, I don't got anything else. And so um, I had to really start to take stock and be like, okay, why have I lost purpose? And who am I as a man now? Like, what are my values? Like, who do I want to show up today and tomorrow? Forget about the past, man. That's not going to teach me anything to live in that. I can use it to learn, but I can't live in it. So how am I going to move forward? And that's where I had to take that chip off my shoulder. You know, being alpha male, spec ops dude, it's like, you know, who am I to listen to Sam? What has Sam done that I'm going to respect Sam for telling me how to be a better man? The truth is, Sam has a ton of great information, but I didn't want to listen because I had this chip on my shoulder. And that's when I realized, dude, I got to take that chip off and I really need to open up because right now I'm not living in purpose and I'm not living in my own authenticity. And that's where I needed to be if I wanted to be a good man. Also, you know, ego can be our huge enemy, can it? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, and, you know, I had to, I, I'm the same way, man. You know, we came to this country with nothing but, but, but huge pride and ego, mm. you know, and, you know, at, you know, I'll, I had to humble myself you know, learn, you know, you know, start with, you know, start at scratch again, you know, yeah. and, and do whatever it took, you know, in my, in my former country, you know, you know, we wouldn't, you know, sweep the floors or clean the toilets, but now we can't, we would, we have to do whatever it took. And that takes a lot of humbling. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that every once in a while, we just need to humble ourselves, you know what I mean? And, and kind of reflect back and figure out a way to humble ourselves and, 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 and ground ourselves, no matter how successful we become, no matter how, you know, we become sometimes because it, it can get away from you. You yeah. know what I mean? It can get away from you. You, you sometimes forget, you know, the reality, you know, you forget, you know, you know, oh my God, man, at one point, dude, like I was there. You forget about that because now you're, you're so much high, you know, you know, higher. And that's something that I had to do, you know, with that. So how men can get out of a situation like, like yours, you know, you know, that, 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 you know, men that kind of like are, I'm so many men right now are lost. You know that, you know that, I mean, that, that's, that's what you do. That's what you talk about, you know, and they're lost they feel like this is it, you know, you know, they, they, you know, they got a nine to five or they got a little, you know, they got a little business, get up, go to work, come home. And they kind of like not pursuing 
anything that they actually fulfills them, makes them, um, you know, makes them happy at heart. And next thing you know, they just kind of get lost in the shuffle and they get depressed and they go through this cycle over and over again. How can a man get out of that cycle? Mm, that's, that's amazing uh, way to put it. And there is that vicious cycle that guys are in and, and comfort is the comfort is the enemy of progress, man. And so the, you know, we want to look at life and when, as you're telling that, uh, you're asking me that I'm listening to you and I'm just thinking, wow, man, we have this such this linear view as human beings and as men, we think once we get somewhere, we never have to go back, right? Like you, you once you become uh, a business owner, you're never going to have to go back and make the phone calls again, right? And do the sales, right? Like that's what people think, but it's like the most successful people are like, man, if it takes me to get back there because I want to try something new, I'm going back there to do it. And then I'm going to climb back up. And and that's where I think a lot of us fail. So for a lot of guys that are out there, they're getting stuck in that comfort. They're like, oh man, I got this nine to five, but you know, if I really wanted to be happy, I would do X, Y, and Z, but that's out of my comfort zone. I don't want to go there. Number one, that's a lot of the conversation they're having. And number two, they're, they're not, uh, you know, and I'll call all the guys out there. I do this all the time is that you're not authentic with yourself because guess what? Everything that you've built your life off of somebody else created for you. You weren't, you didn't create it unless you've taken the time to do the introspection and say what's important to you as a man and make that your foundational, um, your foundational pieces of how you show up every day, how you show up uh, in any situation. And this, this parallels with that base foundation of training is I say, guys, you want to get out of this, start to one, find out who your mentor was when you started growing up. You know, and there's a lot of science behind this. And I know you know this, but from zero to two, our brains are in Delta wave, which is completely, it's like what you sleep in from two to two to seven or two to eight, you're in theta. Well, all that's programming, that's subconscious programming. So a lot of our masculinity was based off of somebody else's version of what a man was. And unless you took that and dissected it at some point in your life and said, oh, wow, I need to change this around you, you still are holding those values. So my first thing is, who was your mentor? Where'd you find your masculinity from? Because that's the first thing is identifying the history. The second thing is look at those features that were given to you and find out what doesn't serve you anymore as the man that you want to be. You know, when you start doing that, you can throw those traits out. And then the third piece is look to people you respect and the men that you like how they show up and you start to put some of those pieces into your foundation. So I'm looking at Sam and I'm like, Sam is uh, somebody who has integrity. He's honest, he's family oriented. Those are things that I wanna put into my box of traits. Cool, I'm looking at Sam and I start to take those positive features and start to build my own foundation now that's in alignment with who I want to show up today and who I want to show up as tomorrow. That's the start of it, man. You gotta have that introspection and be honest with yourself. Wow. You know, why do you think a lot of men don't introspect? You know, is it because the comfort, because it's hard to have that conversation with yourself? Maybe they don't want to face the reality. Or is it that they're, they're, they're so automated, you know, they're automated, automated, automated. And they just go through this thing called life on, you know, on their autonomic nervous system. You know, they, they never really kind of challenge themselves. You know, I'm all about, you know, every, you know I've been introspecting lately, big time. Everything from how I drive, why I drive the way I drive, mm. you know, why why am I on the phone, you know, more than three hours a day, you know, you know, how can I, you know, why do so many people just get comfortable and just go through life on autopilot, and next thing you know, they're like, wait a second, what happened to my life, and how can we how how can we do more introspecting of ourselves, and 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 become more more genuine of who we really are. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And I, I want to give you a quote here from Larry Hagner. So I can't take it, but he uh, he's the dad edge. But he um, he said to me, hell is being on your deathbed and seeing the man you could have been. Oh. And I was like, dude, that hit me. I was like, that gives, gives me tingles right now. Um, and a lot of that, a lot of that lack of introspection is because we're scared. Men are terrified. We're terrified to have the real conversation, because guess what? When I have the introspective conversation, I can't lie. I can't make something up. I can't run from me. 
And that's where guys, every guy wants to lie out loud about their marriage and their sex life and, and their finances and how they're really doing mentally, because we're not conditioned to have that type of openness, especially with other men. Because all of a sudden, if I'm open to Sam, Sam's going to look at me as less than a man and we're no longer equals, right? Like this is the perception we've been created to have. And it's not like, a, it's not like saying that uh, there's a cop out there, but it is addressing the fact that most men are thinking that way. You're, you, you think that you're going to be emasculated if you open up to Sam about this. And that's why we run from that real conversation because then we actually have to question why we do stuff, like you said, who we are, you know, and, and people, when they get to a certain point, don't want to leave the comfort zone or make changes. Because when you start to say, I don't like things about myself, you're left with the obligation to make the changes or you can't complain anymore about your life. You, you need to change in accordance with how you want to change. But if I see those features that I want to change, then also that takes work. And most people, they get to a certain point, you know, this they get to a certain point in life. They're like, Nope, I'm done, man. I don't got to work no more. I'm good. I'm that's where comfort comes in. And so this is where a lot of guys, in my opinion, really, really struggles. All of those components are mixed into one bag. And all of a sudden it's easier for me to hang out with you at a bar on Friday and get drunk. You know, all of a sudden it's easier for me to have friends over and have a barbecue and never have the time to really look at myself and take that, take that honest opinion about, oh man, where am I not showing up and where do I need to do better? And that's, that's really where I think a lot of the flaws come from, brother. Yeah. Love that. Love that. What would you say to younger men mm. that are now listening to this podcast, you know, uh, and what would you say about masculinity? What would you, what would you get them started, you know, as far as, you know, you know, for them to take a right path so that one day they don't end up, you know, you know, like we have. Mm -hmm. I would, I would honestly say, start to evaluate the things that you value as a man in yourself, start to evaluate them and start to think about who you want to be. And when it comes to who you want to be, whether that means that you find somebody like, like I said, like Sam, who's got all these great features. I look up, if I look up to you and I want to be like you, then I want to start to see the features that you have and start to see what I desire to put into my own box, uh, my foundation, but evaluate your internal understanding of who you are, evaluate what you value as a man. Because I'll tell you right now, the, the studies that I've done on this and the, the readings that I've had on it, cross-culturally, masculinity is incredibly different, let alone regionally within the United States. There's no one anchoring for masculinity. There just isn't. It's very different from South America to, to Europe, to Asia, to the Middle East, to Africa, back to the US. Like It's very different everywhere. And so the only thing that you have is what you value and how to be authentic with that. Because when you are, there's no regrets. There's no, oh man, I should have done this. It's, I showed up the way that I chose to show up. I showed up as the man that I chose to show up as. So evaluating that and then finding those features that you really believe are gonna be important to who you are now and moving forward. So I love the fact that you say, you know, masculinity has different definition across cultures and across regions. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm going to have one more last question. I know I'm taking a lot of your time, Jonathan, but what would you say are the basic fundamentals though? You know, I know it's definition, but what would, if all these cultures came together, right? All these regions and cultures together and they said, all right, you know, we need a foundation for masculinity. Mm -hmm. Okay. What will be a few things that are, you know, necessity, necessities we need as men? Be the men that we that we um, out to be. Mm, that's a really good question, and I I love it because um, I've never been asked it. But when I start to evaluate the stuff that I've read, I would say that probably the basic pieces when you're interlocking culturally, some of the basic pieces are um, protection, yeah. 
that's that's one main one every man cross culturally wants to be or desires to be or has some tie to wanting to protect even instinctually i think that's built into us men um another one is uh another one is confidence um men tend to want confidence regardless of where they are in the world they want to have confidence when they get into a room the manliest quote unquote manliest men in any cross culturally you look at they have confidence um and leadership leadership, leadership mm-hmm. is a is a huge masculine quality uh leadership is something that every man i think has an innate ability to want to be a good leader and knows when they're not a good leader. You can see it in people's faces when they're really questioning their position as a leader when it comes to men. And I think cross-culturally, that's a huge piece. So yeah, protection, leadership, and confidence, man, are three ah, that I can really those see. Huge. Those, those are huge. What about, what, I have one, what about provider? provider? Um, you know, I, I, w- I contemplated that uh, as I was saying those to you. But I, I've seen cultures where um, there's really there, there's um, a nuclear family is not an epitome of that culture. Therefore, being a provider for anybody other than themselves doesn't really translate. Um, and you see this in a lot of different cultures. Uh, some of the some of the ones I would say in like Europe are that way. You can see some in um, Asia. You can see some. I mean, so so there's the provider. While I, I value that as a man in, uh, you know, in the U.S., Um, And I know you do as well, but there's some cultures that it just doesn't, it doesn't parallel with them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, because my wife and I always talk about this, you know, and, you know, um, thank God, like I'm the provider, but you know, she was like, what if one day I was the provider? I'm like, you know what? I would have a hard time with that. You know, my my mask of masculinity, you know what I mean? You know, I would, you know, if, if you were the, if you were making more income than me and you were the primary provider, my whole life will be around how can I beat you? You know what I mean? Like, like you know, like that, that's just like, I guess my mask of masculinity, you know, this is something that yeah. I, I hold value and true, you know, you know, to me, you know, and I think that that's why, you know, every culture is different. You just said that we're going back to what you, what, what you just said, every culture, every person is different. But fundamentally, you know, protection, you know, confidence and leadership, that's, you know, that's, that, 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 that can be universal. And John, you just dropped so many knowledge bombs for me, for my audience, and somebody that, you know, something that I can just go right now and take and um, really appreciate you for the time that you spend here and, 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 and your time. Jonathan, for people who want to know about more about what you do, what you offer, you know, could you tell a little bit about where they can find you? Yeah, brother. And, and thank you for having me on here, man. This is just, it's, I've been looking forward to speaking to you with again, with you again, you're an amazing human being. So thank you for letting me speak to your community as well. Um, you guys can find me at Johnny Uh It's J O H N N Y. And then E L S A S S E R. Uh, you can find me over there. Um, you can uh, hit me up on IG. If you ever need anything, you can DM me. If you got any questions, it's just Johnny and then uh, I got my show, The Art of Masculinity, which I had the honor of having Sam on there, which you dropped a ton of knowledge bombs for my community as well. Um, so if you guys uh, want to hop over there and check it out, feel yeah. free. But yeah, man, that's where you can find me. That's how you can uh, support me and, and see what's going on. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate having you, man. God bless. Have a great day. Appreciate you too, Bye. brother. Hey, guys, if you liked today's episode, do me a huge favor, go ahead and leave a comment below, subscribe to the channel, leave me a review, and tag a few friends that you think can benefit from what we share today. Really appreciate it. God bless.